Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit Podcast. This is the conversation about faith, hope, and the impact we're designed to make as Christians on the world around us. Your host, Helen Todd, the Vice President of World Missions Alliance, has spent over two decades traveling to the world's hotspots to meet the spiritual and physical needs of those who are desperate. She interviews guests from different walks of life whose stories, books, and ideas examine today's most pressing issues and challenges of being a Christian today and inspire you to action. I was just driving into work one day and I just said, you know, God, if you're really out there, you have to really meet me. You have to intervene. You have to do something. Because I think I really felt like I've tried the world and it couldn't really give me, you know, there was nothing in it. I still felt a void. That week, I actually got laid off and I, it was a shock to me. And I just literally thought, oh my goodness, like, what am I going to do? I mean, that saved my life. Me being laid off saved my life. My guest today, Ellen Yao, got laid off from her well-paying corporate job immediately after she put an offer on a new house. In this interview, she shares how this seemingly disastrous situation actually saved her life and set her on a path to discover her greater purpose. I'm Helen Todd, the host of the Limitless Spirit podcast, and we're in the middle of Greater Purpose series exploring life stories of people just like you and me who are in hot pursuit of a meaningful life. Ellen grew up in a Christian household, but she never really developed a strong personal relationship with Jesus. As a young adult, she tried to find her identity in partying and racing cars, which as I learned in this interview means modifying cars to make them appear high performance. When all this failed to provide her with fulfillment, Ellen tried climbing the corporate ladder. But it wasn't until she lost her job that everything changed, and she found herself on an adventure of a lifetime, including the experience of sharing Christ in Iraq in the middle of war with ISIS. Let's hear Ellen's story now. Hi, Ellen. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for doing this interview. I'm excited to share your story today. Yeah, I'm excited to share as well. Well, I have not met your parents in person, but they were immigrants from South Korea to the United States. Is that correct? Yes. Back in the early 80s, my parents decided to um, come here along with my mom's family. They have a huge family, so like five of her brothers and sisters, they all decided to come. We were one of the crew that came. (laughs) Where did they live in in Korea? Near Seoul. I was just six years old, and I mean, you know, I I don't remember like too much, but pretty much in the heart of the city, like near Seoul. And do you know what prompted them to move to the United States? I think because my aunt was the first one to make that big move. She really wanted her family. They have about eight siblings, so it's a big family. And also my grandparents were also going to be coming. So they figured like, hey, this is, you know, let's just all stick with the family. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities in America. So it was just one of those opportunities that you just didn't let, you know, miss. So they were not so much escaping certain hardships. They were more looking for a better life. Yes, exactly. I would say that life back in Korea back then was still pretty similar to America. I mean, not quite obviously extravagant and, you know, full of opportunities, but yeah, we would have more opportunities, especially for all the kids. We would definitely have a better life here. And were your family members Christians at the time they were moving here to the United States? No, they were not. In Korea, um, There were Christians there then, I think because of the whole Billy Graham crusades, but my parents were not believers. So how did they come to know Jesus? Was it here in the United States? Yeah. So soon after we came to um, the States, we were in Alexandria, Virginia, which is like literally like 10 minutes from Washington, D.C. We got connected with the neighborhood community and there were a lot of other Korean immigrants there. 
And so they were all going to a church nearby. And so my parents, of course, joined and brought us along. So it was pretty much what we did on Sundays, you know? So you grew up going to church with your parents, and this was the thing that you did on Sunday, but it wasn't really something personal to you. Yeah, I would say just having come to the States, I was learning the language. I mean, I don't, it didn't feel like it took too long, but yeah, we just went along with um, whatever the neighborhood kids did. And it was just a way to just have, I guess, fellowship, you know, it was sense of community. And no, I, I get it. I get it. I mean, there are a lot of Christians actually, <laughs> well, a lot of people that are in church because they crave that community. And it's not necessarily a bad thing unless it replaces the real purpose why we're in church. So you shared with me that you, it was pretty normal, pretty peaceful childhood. You didn't get too much in trouble. And then you go off to college and that's when questions start coming up. We moved obviously um, a couple of times and we moved churches as well during those times. But, you know, we had always remained in the church. My parents at that point were deacons and they were, you know, very deeply involved with their faith. And, and for me, um, I, I still thought I had a relationship. I grew up in the church. I knew all the language. I knew all the songs. I mean, you know, I knew how to act. I mean, it was all just part of, I guess, the routine of things. I mean, I still really thought I was saved, but it wasn't until I went to college and and tasted my first freedom. I felt like it was like, wow, I was seeing the world unprotected and not living in a bubble for the first time. And I think I just kind of, um, you know, went a little wild, as they would say, <laughs> right? And thought, you know what, I need to make my own decisions now. You know, I felt like I was an adult and I need to go explore and I need to figure out what everything was about. Like, who am I and what, you know, and who is God and, and how does he relate to me and what is, you know, who is the true God? And so I had all these questions and, and not enough answers. And I think that I just sort of fell into the world just sort of like a secular worldview because I met a lot of people at that time who were living obviously different lifestyles than I, you know, telling me that you don't have to go to church or, or the, the forest is their church. I mean, I've heard that, <laughs> you know, just, you know, people living like sort of free spirited lives. And I think I just was thinking, yeah, you know, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. So a lot of things started to enter my mind, I think. So were there people in your life then, or maybe other students or professors that tried to encourage you in your faith, or really you didn't have a support group? No, we did. I mean, we had a really strong college community there, but I think it was just in an effort to sort of break out from the mold because I had been living such a, a sheltered bubble life that I really did want to break out because at that time I was literally hanging out with all Christians, like pretty much in my entire life. Nobody ever looked, you know, was different in, you know, we just were all so uniform and it felt like a part of me felt like, Hmm, is this really the way it is? And is this the truth? And I think because, you know, a lot of the people that I knew, um, were also living like a double life because they literally would be saying that they're Christians and would go to church on Sundays, but over the weekend, they were just at the club. So it didn't really make sense to me. And I just thought, are they really Christians? I mean, am I a Christian? Like what's going on? It just, it didn't add up their actions and what they were saying. It, it didn't add up. And I didn't like that. So where did this pursuit of freedom lead you in, in the end? Throughout my 20s, I think I did um, just fall into a different kind of group because I was hanging out with a particular mold of people, very safe and very, you know, and predominantly Asian actually too. And I started to break out and I just started to hang out with different cultures and different people into different hobbies. And and I think I was started getting exposed to a lot of the worldly things and 
and maybe I was deceived, but I felt like, you know, my eyes were open. Right. And I just felt like, oh, wow, this is like, these are exciting people or, you know, I had never been to a club and, you know, and then here I was getting exposed into this, you know, this different, you know, world. It was exciting at the time. You know, I was meeting like, cool people. That's what I thought. I mean, people who were, you know, drinking or smoking and I had never been around that kind of stuff. So to me, I just thought like, wow, like maybe this is what, you know, like it's like, I don't know, (laughs) you know, just, it felt like a different world. Right. So you wanted to explore things that you knew nothing about and you had not been exposed prior to that. So what did you find? I was easily influenced. So I went, so Groups of people that I met, we would just kind of naturally get into the hobbies that our friends were getting into. And so at that time, I don't know if you remember the Fast and the Furious, but we were really into the car scene. (laughs) So it was really funny at that time. So you were like a car racer? No, I wasn't a car racer. I was probably more of a ricer. They, They would say that for people who would try to modify their cars, but there was really no, um, significant technical done to the car. It was all just like a a superficial (laughs) modification. You you know how they would like tint the car and make the car look really cool. And you have, yeah, like big wheels and make loud noises. So were you doing that to your car or you were hanging out with people who were doing that to their cars? Yeah, I was actually getting into it. So here I was spending my money on like modifying cars as well you know, and getting involved with these people going to different events and, and, you know, these people, you know, yeah, it was just something to do at that time. And I think I was sort of lost and I was trying to find my identity, but obviously this was not, you know, my true calling because I still felt empty. Like there was still a void. And after all of that, you know, party phase and all of that um, passed away, you know, I knew I needed to settle down. So as I was, you know, working in the corporate arena, I was just, you know, working in the IT field, settling down, and I wasn't really partying and, you know, doing those foolish things. I just thought like, okay, I just need to settle down. I need to, you know, climb the corporate ladder and I need to, you know, get a house. You know, that was kind of my thought process. So you, you try to try out the perception of what adult life should look like, right? That was youth and fun. Now I'm an adult. I'm going to make a career. I'm going to buy a house, picket fence, all that. Yes. So I thought, you know, I need to settle down. This is how you do that by, you know, being, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and making money and, and all that. So one day, I mean, I had been doing this for a couple of years now. And I was just driving into work one day and normally I'm just always blasting the music and not even really thinking. I just couldn't take the noise anymore, literally in the car. And I just turned off the music and, and I just said, you know, like, wow, you know, God, if you're really out there, you know, you have to really meet me. You have to intervene. You have to do something because I think I really felt like I've tried the world and it couldn't really give me, you know, there was nothing in it. I still felt a void. But after that short little, you know, prayer, I literally just forgot about it, went on about my, you know, day. And um, it wasn't until the end of the week, that week, I actually got laid off and it was a shock to me. And I just literally thought, oh my goodness, like, what am I going to do? Now you also just put an offer on the new house too, right? Yeah, I did. It was a townhome and um, I thought like, oh, wow, I, it looked good. Like I thought I would get this, you know, get this home. And I was scared. I was freaking out about that. But, but actually there was this calm that came over me that week. And, and I just thought, you know what? Something in me just said, you need to go back to school. And so I just listened to that. And I just said, okay, I will. And, you know, this is, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to now prepare myself to go back into academia, go to school. So you didn't end up getting that house, right? No, thank God. It just there. Yeah. Things didn't work out. And I think, you know, they never picked my offer. So yeah, there was a couple of other offers and I didn't get picked. So it was fine. It worked out. So I didn't, you know, I don't have some huge debt following me, but, but yeah, I ended up prepared, you know, I decided I need to prepare for school. And school starts usually in the fall. So I had several months because this was early on in the year. 
so now I had all this time and I thought, I think I'm going to just go back to church. And I hadn't been to church in several years at that point. So just out of the blue, I decided I'm going to go, go to church. And so I joined um, this local church and heard the gospel being preached. And I think my heart was just so open to the truth that I really received the word. I felt like the Lord really just started to flush out just all the stuff in my heart and my mind that I had picked up. And I knew that he was real because it was just such a tangible moment for me, an encounter that I knew it was God. And so I started, you know, I repented of my sins. I, you know, just really received Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And yeah, and just got really hungry for the word of God. I mean, I really literally would you know, read the Bible several hours and just like start weeping. And I didn't even know why I was weeping, but I would just find that to be my routine. And before I was supposed to leave for school, um, yeah, I really just said, you know, Lord, whatever happens, I just really give, you know, my life to you. I mean, I wanted whatever to happen to be based on his will for my life. That's a powerful moment that you know, it, it's that moment when your life starts to change. And, and I love hearing that in a person's story. So did you meet your husband, Matt, after that, soon after that? Yeah, literally within like two months, I met my, <laughs> I met Matt at school. So, you know, you wouldn't have gone back to school if you didn't lose that job. So there were so many blessings attached to that loss of a job. And sometimes we stress over things, you know, because they don't turn out the way we want them to. But how many blessings were tied to that being laid off for you? Your salvation experience, meeting your future husband? Oh, yes. Yeah. So many things came from that. Just thinking about it, reflecting on it, because I hadn't thought about this story for so long. There, yeah, I'm just so grateful. I mean, because of that experience, I mean, that saved my life. Me being laid off saved my life. So was was you, when you met Matt, was this love at first sight? Uh, we, <laughs> I mean, definitely there was a God story behind that as well. I feel like we definitely met. It was a divine appointment. We connected and we literally started dating right away and got married within the year. So within a year of me going back to school, I was married and, you know, God just really provided and brought this amazing man into my life. And, and, you know, now, of course, you know, we have a four-year-old and we've just been so blessed. Well, it's interesting because the circumstances at which you and I met, met were rather unusual. So, for our listeners who don't know, it was year 2014, and one day I received a phone call at World Missions Alliance from a young woman from Virginia, and of course the year 2014 is the year when the war in Iraq between the Iraqi forces and ISIS escalated to the point of a really severe military conflict, we had a mission trip scheduled to go to Iraq. And at this point, we're still debating. Uh, the mission trip was scheduled for November, and we're still debating whether we should go. We have a church there. We haven't missed one year since the church was started in 2006 of going there and ministering at that church. But the situation is pretty intense. You know, we had to consider the safety of our team. And so at this time, I receive a phone call from a young woman from Virginia who found us on Google. And she says that she wants to go with us to Iraq. So I have to ask you, Ellen, how did this thought even come to your mind at this point in your life that you wanted to go on a mission trip to Iraq? That summer... As I was watching as well on the news, just all of the devastation and the chaos and war going on over there, I just really sensed the tugging of the Lord to really just be a part of it. And I didn't know how, so I just prayed and literally started out sending Bibles overseas. And that turned into just a stronger um, tugging of the Lord just working in me, in my heart. And I just felt this pull 
I don't really know if I can describe it, but I really sense the Lord saying, you know, there's more, there's more for you. And I just said, wow, God, do you want me to go there? I mean, what's going on? This is crazy. Like, no one's going to go there. And I knew that this was a long shot because I thought, am I hearing correctly? Like, what's going on? This is literally a war zone. <laughs> it's a war zone. It's a Muslim country. Right. And so I said, you know, God, if you want me to go there, then you have to let Matt be on board and also my parents. So I put those two caveats. I said, Lord, if this is from you, you have got to make a way because I know they're not, they're going to all think I'm crazy. So after having a talk with Matt one day, he actually said, I mean, if the Lord's calling you, then you got to obey him. And and also my parents also gave me the okay. And I just thought, what's going on? Are they like, are they crazy? But I knew, I knew in my heart that I was supposed to go. And that's how I found you guys. No one else was going. I mean, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> we specialize in that, going to the places where no one else is going. But I, I to be honest, you know, when I heard you on the phone, I thought to myself, she must be a thrill seeker. She must be in for adventure ride. And uh, I was concerned about having a person on the team outside of God's will under those circumstances. Well, actually, under any circumstances, it's not a great idea. And so I remember telling you, well, I need to know that your husband is on board with this decision because in marriage to become one, and if God is truly calling you, then he has to be on board. And I thought to myself, what husband would allow his wife to go to Iraq at this moment, at this particular moment? But when you told me that Matt was on board and you had his blessing, I had to recognize that this has to be of the Lord. And the more I spoke with you, the more I felt like you were serious. You were not there just for adventure. You were not there. You were not wanting to go just because you wanted to experience something dangerous. I, I sensed that it was the Lord. And of course, it was the truth because just watching you on the mission field there and seeing how God used you was uh, very clear that it was truly God's will. But tell me your impressions. This was your first mission trip with World Missions Alliance. Was this your first mission trip in general? Helen, yes. I mean, if, <laughs> if you can even believe it. What a trip to pick for my first trip. Yeah, I mean, it really was. And the funny thing is, is before this trip, our church was heavily involved with missions and I actually thought about going and it never panned out. And so these were places like India and other places, but so I had been preparing myself thinking, oh yeah, I know God's going to call me one day, you know? And, and I thought, oh, for sure, you know, I'm going to go with my church. We're going to go to India. And this was, I think, you know, like a year or two before this, um, but it didn't work out. And I just thought, okay, I guess, you know, there's definitely a timing aspect and I know God's going to call certain people. And so for me to get this prompting for Iraq, I just thought I'm, I must not be hearing God. <laughs> like what is going on? Like, and for it to be my first trip, I thought, what is this? But I remember that call to you. I remember you said, <laughs> I was expecting someone to be like really excited. And I remember you were very stern and you said, you know, okay, you know, you, you better pray about this for a week or two and then call me back. <laughs> and I remember that. And I just said, okay, um, you know, they're very serious. So, so I made that, you know, I did, I prayed for that week or two and, and it was the same response. I just, you know, God just said, you know, this is it. And so, yeah, this was my first trip and, and what a trip. I mean, I'll never forget this trip. Right. I mean, it, I just sense God's heart all over this trip. I have never, ever felt safer in my life. I mean, if that sounds crazy, I mean, I'm telling you, right, Helen? I mean, we all said when I got there, I would just never was scared. I mean, it was crazy. But God's hand of protection was just so over our group and this trip. Well, and it is crazy because we were uh, in Duhok, which is the city in northern part of Iraq, the Kurdish territory 
which was protected by the Kurdish troops, but we were less than 30 miles from Mosul, which was the headquarters of ISIS. So that sense of safety and protection was definitely supernatural because it, it was not coming from the reality or the visible circumstances. Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely. I mean, you just saying that again, I mean, I feel like, <laughs> wow, who would go there 30 miles? And I still remember when we went up on the mountaintop seeing smoke and flames. Like I, I remember that there were some areas on the mountain where it was like smoking. And, um, and I think I remember still believing like, wow, the only time I think that I genuinely felt scared was the driving. <laughs> but that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty much anywhere overseas. You're just scared of driving. <laughs> but, you know, it's been over, a little over six years, and I realize that you may not remember everything. But what was maybe one favorite moment during that trip, or maybe a couple of favorite moments? It was a medical mission. So I remember thinking, okay, I don't belong there. I, I'm not in the healthcare. But the Lord specifically, you know, told me to bring my guitar and that I was, and you guys needed like a worship person. So I said, oh, sure, I'd be happy to be a part of that. And so I knew that there was a purpose. And, and I knew that me bringing my guitar meant that I would actually leave my guitar there, that I was supposed to gift this guitar. And, and my guitar, I really love my guitar. So it was really like one of those, okay, Lord, you got to really send the right person. And I remember landing in at the Duhok airport. And the first thing they said was, oh, your guitar is missing. And I just thought, what? Lord, this can't be, Lord. You told me to bring my guitar. I mean, it didn't make sense. I remember I was in the lost and found line thinking, having a conversation with the Lord, you know, God, I just got here. Like, how can my guitar be missing, Lord? This doesn't make any sense. And then uh, just, you know, waiting in line. And I think a couple, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes later, someone was yelling, oh, we found your guitar. It was under a tarp. And and I just thought, wow, like, okay, I knew there was a purpose. And and just throughout the whole time there, just looking around to see if anyone had any in interest in the guitar, but there was nobody actually showing any interest in it. And so I just thought, okay, I don't know, Lord, what's going on? I remember we were introduced to um, a Korean couple in, that were living in Duhok at the time. And she, we ended up connecting and she shared with me her story and then how her son was also in Duhok. He brought all his stuff, but he couldn't bring his guitar. And as soon as she told me that, I knew that I was supposed to gift my guitar to her son. And so when I met with him, he, you know, it was just one of those God moments. Like I knew that this guitar, God had told me to give this guitar to him. And it was pretty amazing. Wow. You know, I even forgot this moment. I vaguely remember now as you're sharing it. And I remember that couple, they came to one of the services, but that is just incredible how God works, you know, and there were so many other moments in my memory. I see you as being at the refugee settlement and I see you sitting with this guitar and a whole large group of kids standing around you watching and listening to you play worship songs and them taking out their little cell phones and, and taking pictures and videos of you. That was just the most beautiful moment. That That's the picture that I see in my mind when I think of you on that mission trip. But that moment that you shared is extremely powerful, too. And since then, you've been on another mission trip with WMA to Israel. And now you're getting ready to start leading the chapter of World Missions Alliance in Washington, D.C. and Virginia area. So God has taken this, this first mission trip and developed something absolutely beautiful, a beautiful relationship between you and World Missions Alliance. But let me ask you this. Do you feel like you have discovered your greater purpose? You said that in college, as you were going through these years of rebellion, if you will, you said you were seeking for your purpose and for your identity. Do you feel like you have found it? Yeah, definitely. I know that it's still a journey for me and, and knowing that, you know, my identity is that I'm a child of God and, 
and that I, you know, his will for my life is what I'm still pursuing. And, and he shows me obviously in seasons, it's not like, I feel like it's not like it has all unfolded and I know everything, but I know that I am moving in the right direction. And, and I know that that trip and, and just, you know, that losing that job that one time, all of it just was this beautiful tapestry that God was like sort of knitting together and unfolding for me to find out. And this journey has just been so incredible. I would have never thought from that Iraq trip that I would be partnering up with you guys and, and to be able to start now this DC, you know, charter. I mean, I, you know, you always said that God always qualifies the unqualified and that has never left me because I truly feel unqualified, but yet just being with God and following what he has for me. And really that has just kept me on this path. And, and he, it's always an adventure. Like I just find myself just on this adventure with the Lord and it's so exciting. And I'm just, I just never know what tomorrow is going to hold for me. And wow, to, to be in, you know, just this whole thing. I mean, I'm very like humbled and excited and just so excited for what God has for, yeah, just this area of Washington, D.C. I'm, this is some incredible, unprecedented time, obviously, right? 2020 pandemic. But going into 2021, I just find like so much hope. There's this fire that there's this electricity in the air in Washington, D.C. that I feel like the harvest is really ripe and people are so ready to receive the gospel. I'm excited for this journey. I think you're speaking very prophetically right now, and I too am excited that you lost your job that one day, <laughs> and that as a result, we met and our paths were crossed, and I look forward to what God has in store for us together between you and World Missions Alliance. And thank you so much for coming on this uh, podcast, for sharing your story, Ellen. And I know that it will encourage many. God qualifies the unqualified. Maybe like Ellen Yao, you felt drawn to get involved with missions work, but you feel unsure, afraid, or maybe even unqualified. I want you to know that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And if he's calling you to do something greater than you, he will give you the ability to succeed. You can learn more about getting involved with World Missions Alliance by visiting our website, rfwma.org. By the way, one of the reasons we've been sharing stories on this podcast about people finding their greater purpose is because we have a conference coming up later this year, and it's all about finding greater purpose. In fact, it's called the Greater Purpose Conference. It is just a few months away, and I would love to see you there. There are details about it on the website. Again, it's rfwma.org. Thank you for listening to this episode of Limitless Spirit. And I want to say again, thank you to my guest, Ellen Yao, for joining me today. I'm Helen Todd. God bless you. Until next time. Limitless Spirit is produced by World Missions Alliance. If you believe in the importance of the Great Commission, sharing Christ around the world and helping those in need, check out our website, rfwma.org. If you liked what you heard, consider supporting the Limitless Spirit podcast by going to rfwma.org slash give. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Tune in next week for another exciting